Um, nice to see you all here. Thank you for coming. For those who haven't been to a Making Space for Art talk before, I can tell you that this is the third year of its running. We've had a wonderful array of speakers, um, mostly curators, but some practicing artists also, um, from a wide range of national and international um, uh, art spaces, art museums and, its, and galleries. And it's been a wonderful opportunity to think about the different spaces in which one encounters art, the way in which art can reflect different spaces or even change them, and how we engage and interact with those various spaces. Um, it's lovely to have today's guest speaker, Jeanette de Hude, who's over from, yes, I was practicing that. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Who is here from uh, the Netherlands? She's the curator at the Kröller Müller Museum in Otterlo, which is an absolutely, well, the image will give you a bit of an idea. It's an absolutely magnificent space, both the building and the park that surrounds it. And Jeanette will be telling us more about that. Um, before Jeanette uh, came to the Kröller Müller, she was for nearly a decade the curator at the, the Kunsthall Rotterdam, where she curated a wonderful array of exhibitions. And I'll just, just to give you a sense of the, the, the range of her work, um, she curated exhibitions on Anthony Gormley in 2006, Stanley Spencer, I think that was one of the first um, international exhibitions of, the very first international exhibition of Stanley Spencer, hugely successful show. Um, then, in, that was 2011-12. In 2014, she curated a show on the little known artist known as James Bond. Um, so a very different kind of, of exhibition. Um, and uh, Keith Haring in 2015. And since she went to the Kröller Müller, she's already curated a show called Nature Based, and earlier, uh, well, last winter and, and currently running, there's a beautiful exhibition on Erli van Gogh. And later this year, opening in May, a bit of shameless self-promotion, is the magnificent exhibition App, The Poetry of Forms, which will be an absolute hit, <laughs> I'm told. Anyway, to um, you. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a real pleasure yeah. to have Janet here, and she will be talking on the subject of this quotation from the founder of the museum, for the benefit and the pleasure of the community. So over to you, Janet. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank you very much for the invitation to give a lecture in this series, Making Space for Art. And I'd like to thank Professor Eric Robertson in particular for this wonderful invitation. Thank you. And secondly, I want to apologize for reading my lecture to you from paper because my English is not my mother, my mother tongue and I thought it was smart to write it down in advance and in doing so buying myself some time to get the information and formulation uh, right. So it's a tremendous honor to be able to talk here at the Royal Holloway University about the museum where I've been working as a curator for just a year and a half now because I can honestly say that I work at the most beautiful museum in the Netherlands, possibly in Europe, or maybe even the world, but I don't want to do be too presumptuous. Mm -hmm. So, this afternoon, I'd like to take you into the history of the Kroll Müller Museum. This is important for the theme, making space for art, as you will see. I want to explain why the museum lies in the middle of the country, at the heart of the largest nature reserve of the Netherlands. But I also want to show you how the art is accommodated in the Krullermüller Museum, why the building and its surroundings look the way they do. The building, its location, the collection, and how the art is presented inside and outside the museum are inseparably linked with the founder, Helene Krullermüller, and the directors that followed her after her death in 1939. It is the artistic conception of Helene Krullermüller, Bram Hammacher, Rudy Oxenaar, Evert van Straten, and now Lisette Pelsus that have determined how the artworks are given space at the museum. 
First, a few important dates and events to give you a framework for this afternoon's story. And there's a lot to take in here, but there are some important, more important dates than others, <laughs> you could say. For instance, 1907, 1908, that's the moment that Helene Krullemuller starts to buy art. And in 1921, she starts to construct the Grand Museum on the Hoge Veluwe. That's not the museum where we are living, uh, working in now, but uh, she started and had to halt it a year later because of the Great Recession. She even had to st stop uh, acquiring art in 1922. But in 1938, another very important date, was the Transitional Museum opened. One of the buildings is still, the, the, one of the buildings where we are working in now. And another important year is 1961. That's the opening of the Sculpture Garden. And in 77, the opening of the Wim Christ wing, which she loved so much. Some of these dates will come later on back in the lecture. So, for the benefit and the pleasure of the community, this is what Helene Krulle Müller writes in 1925 when seeking to justify the reason for her art collection. It is the goal of the art collection that she assembled roughly between 1908 and 1922. And to this day, we still rely on this idea of our founder. Her philosophy partly determines how we think about our exhibitions, how we present art. It colors how we think about our activities and the acquisitions we make to add to the collection. <clears throat> Due to the exceptional, exceptional location of the museum in the middle of the park, we are cut off from the rest of the world, as it were. You might perhaps compare it to a monastery. We are at the heart of the Hoge Veluwe Park, which is 25 hectares uh, uh, big. And the visitors really have to undertake something. They have to do their best to come and view the art. And for many, a visit to the museum is a one-day retreat. One very important reason for our visitors to make the effort is the large collection of work by Vincent van Gogh. That collection was largely assembled by Helene. And I'll come back to that later in this lecture. But another important reason for people is to visit, to visit the Quillemuller is the Sculptures Garden. The garden opened in 1961, making it one of the first sculpture gardens in the world. And the original idea for this garden was from Bram Hammachers, that was the second director. And it has since grown into an important space for exhibiting sculpture in the open air. But let me start at the beginning. In 1911, at the age of 42, Helene is hospitalized with a serious illness. She is told that she needs an operation, which is far from certain that she'll survive, and she makes a solemn promise to establish a museum, to build a monument to culture for the community. She wants to enable everyone to become acquainted with the develop developments in modern painting, and particularly with the work of Vincent van Gogh. She finds this artist, and bear in mind it's only 1911, and Vincent van Gogh is only known among a select group of collectors and enthusiasts, but she finds the work of this artist the most important thing that modern painting has produced at that moment. During her lifetime, she acquires 11,500 objects for the collection. By comparison, our collection currently contains roughly 20,000 objects, so half of our current collection was assembled by the founder. To purchase, to purchase the artworks, she uses the funds from the company Muller & Co, run by her husband, Anton Kruller. The company originally belonged to her father, but after his death, her husband, Anton, takes the helm. He develops, develops it into a powerful international concern with major interest in shipping, in grain trade in America and the operation of ore mines mainly in North Africa and Spain. And the headquarters are located on the Lange Voorhout in The Hague. <coughs> Helene conceives the idea to collect art when she comes into contact through her daughter with Hendrik Bremmer, an art educator who gives lessons in art and art appreciations to, appreciation to ladies from high society. And she's very impressed with his lessons and soon asks him for private lessons. She even employs him as a personal advisor on the acquisition of art. And together, 
They visit artists, studios, auctions, and art dealers in the Netherlands and abroad. Helene is a frequent letter writer, and for us, this is a rewarding source of information to see and understand how she operated, but also how she thought about her acquisitions. Welcome. She writes almost every day to her confidant, Sam van Deventer. And from Paris, she writes in 1910, and I quote, This morning, we went to look at the rest of the Van Goghs. Mind you, the rest of the Van Goghs. They were wonderful. I'll just mention the subjects. A basket of apples, like lemons, only a little tighter, perhaps, and thinner, but stemming from the same sentiment. A valley. Imagine, you wandered over a mountain pass, climbed, descended, constantly with a bubbling stream beside you, which was sometimes still in the deeper parts, sometimes rushing over descending ground. And you wandered back home, closed your eyes, and still saw the precipice stream, the blooming banks, and everything together had woven itself into a joyful, colorful, colorful tapestry. But the most beautiful is an olive grove, so soft and intimate, and such a complete large painting. End of quote. Helene buys rapidly, and after a few years, she owns the largest private collection of Van Gogh paintings in the world. She ultimately assembles 91 paintings and 175 drawings by Vincent van Gogh. To fulfill her promise to enable everyone to become acquainted with the developments in modern painting, she installs in 1913 the first floor of the Lange Voorhout as a museum. People can visit the Modern Art Museum by appointment. And in the House Museum, Helene has hung the artworks according to her idea and her vision regarding the developments in art and art history. <clears throat> in the many letters that have been preserved, her thinking about art can be followed quite closely. But in 1923, she gives a series of lectures from the Volksuniversiteit at The Hague, which are collected under the title Beschouwingen over problemen in de ontwikkeling der moderne schilderkunst. Reflections on problems in the development of modern painting, not modern art. In this, she explains quite clearly what it's all about for her. She distinguishes two directions in art, realism and idealism. In her view, both proceed from the perceived reality, whereby the realists are mainly engaged in observation, Lighting, material expression, and the effects of color and perspective. And on the other hand, the idealists abstract the shapes. They instead offer a depiction, they instead offer a depiction of their idea of reality. Among the modern artists, it's only the cubists that she admires open. It's mainly the cubists that she admires openly. She acquires by, uh, work by, amongst others, Pablo Picasso and Juan Gris and she passionately advocates the new movement. And she also has a great admiration for the new work of Piet Mondrian. She calls it Cubist art in its purest form. But the Lange Voorhout Museum is merely a prelude to the ground plans that she has. She wants to build a large museum on its residence, and to this end employs various architects to make a design. This includes Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, but also Peter Behrens, and neither expense nor effort was spared. To properly assess the designs, Helene has them, has them the, the designs, built in full size in wood covered with painted canvas. And you see it on the second photo. These structures are then put on wheels and placed in the intended location in Wassenaar, near The Hague. But she was not convinced and she shifts her attention to the Veluwe. Because there, her husband has meanwhile bought large pieces of land to pursue his hobby of hunting. The Veluwe has become a place where they enjoy staying together, far from the bustle of the city and close to nature, to live there for much of the year in a simple farmhouse. And here, her plan to unite culture and nature develops gradually to build a museum for art surrounded by the silence and emptiness of the forest and dunes. She awards a new commission to the Dutch architect Hendrik Berlage this time. 
he too enters the service of the family and designs, among other things, Sint Hubertus, the later residence of the Krullen Muller family in the Hoge Veluwe Park um, in Otter, near Otterlo. It's not a, a simple farmhouse, you could say, but well. <laughs> But before the work really begins and the design for the museum, for, uh, on the design for the museum home, their collaboration falters. And in 1919, Berlage leaves for The Hague, where he builds the Gemeentemuseum. Helene then invites the Belgian architect Henry van der Velde to continue the project. He starts to work on the design of the museum in 1920. And a year later, the construction of the building actually begins. And you see here the exact location of the building. Located, located near the Franse Berg, the French mountain. Well, mountain is a small hill. And they work with great haste. And again, no expense is spared. Thus, a special railway line is built on the Veluwe to transport the bespoke building blocks to the intended location at the Franse Berg. And here you see the design. It's really a, a large building. But Helene is beset by misfortune. misfortune. Just two years after the building of the museum started, she writes a letter to Bremer, her teacher and advisor. The financial conditions no longer allow her to continue acquiring art, let alone that it allows her to build a museum. Muller & Co. suffers from the severe recession in the early 20s, and the company incurs significant losses. The Krullen Mullers almost go bankrupt. Not only is the construction of the museum halted and the purchasing of art for the collection ceased, even the preservation of the, of the country estate and the collection that she assembled in previous years is put at risk. To keep the collection together, Helene decides to donate it to the Dutch state on the condition that a suitable museum will be built to house it. The design of Van der Velde, however, is also too expensive for the state, and the architect is asked to make a new design for what Helene calls a transitional museum. Van der Velde's design is much smaller and more intimate than his first plan, plan of the Grand Museum. It is clear in his composition. The entrance is at the road. It's a very vague picture, but here you enter the building. <coughs> And once inside, the public walks through a long corridor with small cabinets for paintings left and right, enabling the visitor to walk through the history of art, as it were. And in the first rooms hang works of old masters such as Lucas Kranach, the Elder, and Floris van Schoten as benchmarks for the developments in modern painting as described by Helene. And the middle section, and I mean by the middle section, room. The middle section is reserved for the work of Vincent van Gogh. His work is the heart of the collection, and here Helene also places, places it in the heart of the museum. In her opinion, he is the most important artist in whom realism and idealism converge. This is the highest possible achievement in modern painting, in her view. Helene opens the museum herself in 1938, but dies the following year. Her, her husband also dies two years later, and they are both buried at the Franse, on the Franse Berg, near the spot where Helene Krullemuller had initially planned her Grand Museum. And here you can see her coven in the museum, surrounded by the works she much loved. After the Second World War, Bram Hammacher is appointed as director of the museum in 1948. He is confronted with a museum that houses a wonderful collection of modern painting, but also with the desire of the founder to preserve this collection as it is. Helene saw her collection as complete. And if Hammacher were, strictly, were to strictly adhere to her wishes, he would have become the director of a mausoleum, a place where art hangs in silence, but where nothing would change. And he was not the kind of man to accept this, and one of the first things he devoted himself was, uh, one of the first things he devoted himself to was the plan for an extension of the building with a conqueror's wing and a large sculpture garden, both designed again by Henry van der Velde. This is initially conceived 
this new large sculpture garden by Van der Velde as a confined outer room of the museum. But Hammacher wanted an environment with greater exhibition possibilities and with a design that enhances the, and he says, he writes down, spatial effect of sculptures and the effects of light on the works. Hammacher longs for an open, light space with large windows for the sculptures to thus create a clear relationship with the surrounding nature. He wants to make sculpture a second speciality of the museum, and he follows the developments in the contemporary sculpture closely. And much is happening. The staging of sculpture exhibitions in parks and gardens was flourishing in the years after the Second World War. In London, the open-air exhibition of sculpture at Battersea Park was held in 1948, and it was extremely well attended. The exhibition consisted entirely of modern work, all made in the last 50 years by Auguste Rodin, Aristide Mayol, Henri Moore, Fritz Wotruba, Wissel Cousin, and many, many others. It was a first in a series of exhibitions that were repeated every three years. And not only was it the first in Britain, it also acted as a catalyst for many others elsewhere. Two years later, in 1950, for instance, Antwerp organized an international sculpture exhibition in Middelheim Park. This too was highly successful, and it was decided to repeat it every two years. And Middelheim organized this sculpture bi biennial until well into the 1990s. And following the example of the London exhibition, Arnheim in Holland organized its first sculpture exhibition in Sonsbeek Park in 1949, sculpture in European sculpture in the open air. Bram Hammacher was closely involved in the organization of this first Sonsbeek exhibition. He was a member of the honorary committee. But the other editions of Sonsbeek were also decisive for the, for the additions to the sculpture collection in the park and the way that the landscape around the museum was approach, approached. The Battersea Park exhibition, Middelheim Park and the Sonsbeek showed Hammacher the direction that he wanted to take and he developed the plan for a permanent outdoor sculpture exhibition in a park near the museum. Henry van der Velde, the architect, points out the possibility for extending the collection of sculptures on the east side of the new wing being added to the museum. And so it happened. So this is the old museum. This is the extension and east of that. He proposes to make a park there. Landscape architect Beihauer is asked to make a provisional sketch design for a sculpture garden in the direction of the Franse Berg. He bases his thinking on the idea that the sculpture gallery completed in 1953 would be, and I quote, extended as it were into the open air and, from, and form the transition from indoor museum to outdoor museum, unquote. He arrives at a highly articulated layout of outdoor galleries around a main exhibition space, as you can see here. It took eight years to complete, but in 1961, the sculpture garden opens with the lawns, lawns bordered by green walls, hedges, but also many rhododendrons and a variety of different trees. The outdoor area is designed by Beihauer as if it were museum galleries, the green walls function as a backdrop for the sculptures installed. In anticipation of the opening, Hammacher continued acquiring sculptures in the eight years leading up to it. And in accordance to with Helene Krullemuller's paintings collection, he focuses mainly on the developments in modern sculpture. He commissions several artists to make a work of art specifically for the garden, which incidentally, were by no means all realized without a struggle. Marta Pan, for instance, asked Beihauer for a pond for her swan, but the architect finds a pond on the Hoge Veluwe out of place. He finds it too artificial, too contrived. But ultimately, the, the, the wish of Marta Pan is granted and the little lake is constructed and her swan has been floating there ever since the opening. It is Hammacher's wish to show the interplay between the sculptures themselves and between the sculptures and nature. Or, as he writes, the sculpture gallery was like chamber music compared to the orchestral music, music outside. 
Immediately after his appointment as director of the museum in 1963, Rudy Oxenaar enthusiastically continues this line in the collection policy of Hammacher. In the sculpture garden, he orders the reconstruction of the pavilion that Gerrit Rietveld designed for the third Sonsbeek exhibition in 1955. After this uh, exhibition at Sonsbeek, the pavilion was dis dismantled and after long and intensive lobbying for reconstruction and with Oxnard's permission for the spot in the park, the reconstruction could begin. For the opening, an exhibition was organized with the work of Dame Barbara Hepworth, who finds this place one of the most, if not the most, exceptional spot to exhibit her sculptures. When returning home after the opening of the pavilion, she wrote to her friend Warren Forma, and I quote, I have just returned from my most beautiful exhibition at Otterlo. Never again will I see my work in such perfect and wonderful conditions and surroundings. The new Rietveld Pavilion is a glorious thing in itself, unquote. In the meantime, major renovations are carried out on the old museum building of Henry van der Velde. The building no longer meets the requirements for a museum at that, at that time. And in 1970, the Dutch architect Wim Quist is appointed to make plans for a new building. More space is needed for the reception of the public. But much more important is that Oxnard is seeking space for the art of his time. And he does so not just with, Quist commission, with the Quist Commission for the design of a new building, but also with an extension of the sculpture garden. He initiates a new program of summer presentations for young British and American sculpture. And in 1966, he opens the extended garden with an exhibition by David Smith. The following year, he invites Anthony Caro and Eduardo Paolozzi. The sculpture gar garden can, where decided, be altered, as Oxenau writes to Caro. And he writes, we have always seen our lawns as a working floor where anything should be possible. Any necessary adjustment can be made, moving, flattening, sandy areas, hills, holes, platforms of pavements. It will be custom built for your convenience." Unquote. But not only the landscaping changes, also the way sculptures work and their ideas change rapidly in those years. In the annual report of 1973, it says, in sculptural art, many new insights have now occurred. There's an increase in scale and an increasing use of new materials, but, all, but above all, new conceptions regarding the functioning of sculptures. Two years earlier, together with Wim Beren, Oxena curated the exhibition Sonsbeek 71, Sonsbeek buiten de perken, or Sonsbeek outside the borders, where the, park of artists, where, the park, where the work of artists such as Klaas Oldenburg, Robert Smithson, Carl André and Richard Long was placed not only in the park, but also far beyond throughout the Netherlands. Sculpture had become site-specific. And Oxena sought to make space for the new art, both literally and figuratively. He invites many of the artists with whom he collaborated for the Sonsbeek exhibition to either make a new sculpture in the park or the forest, or to place one there. So Richard Serra found this bowl-shaped bowl valley as a location for a new work. It's one of his first works in Quartan steel. At the foot of the slope, he places three huge st steel plates, and the center of the valley is empty. Because the plates are not placed concentric to one another, there's also no center point. And the spin-out in the title refers to the experience you have as a visitor when you walk precisely in the middle, an outward, outward movement. Oxenaar also commissions Jean Dubuffet to realize his Jardin des Mailles full size. Oxenaar has already seen the maquettes and models that Dubuffet made for proposed constructions in late 1960 in Paris. And he'd become utterly intrigued with the idea that once realized, it would be possible to enter those models so that the visitor could actually walk around in a completely artificial world. And the third example of a sculpture that Oxenaar made space for in the Hoogveluwe Park is Oldenburg's Trouwel. It was originally made for the Sonsbeek Buiten de Perken edition, but the production costs of the sculpture were so high 
that Oxenar offered to have the museum pay for it as long as Oldenburg donated the work to the museum after the event. And so it was. And just last year, we restored this work completely and gave it a new paint job. The blue had become seriously faded over the years and had literally lost its sheen. We knew that it was originally a silver trowel. Once we started our research, it emerged that not only the color of trowel has changed, but also the title, the shape, a new version was made in 1976 with a different shaped handle, but also the location in the park was changed. This is all, uh, uh, Oldenburg sitting in uh, Arnheim at that moment. But here you see the two locations of a trowel in the Hoogveluw Park. Today it stands beside the entrance road to the museum, but for years it stood in one of the rhododendron rooms in the sculpture garden. In 1977, the new wing, designed by Wim Quist, was opened. Light and space, art and nature are the key words for the new museum concept. Everything is on one floor. And just to give you a bit of an idea, this is the old building with the extension from Van der Velde. And that's placed by Wim Quist. Everything's on one floor. The long corridors that connect the different spaces have large windows from floor to ceiling, and Quist has made the transition between nature and architecture as gentle as possible. So you can see here. The entrance is literally the intersection between the public outdoor space on the one hand and the museum and sculpture garden on the other. Here we stand on the public space, not paid yet for our entrance, and you go through the glass corridor, immediately can step outside again into the sculpture garden. Oxenar reserves the new rooms for art made after 1945. And for the opening exhibition, he chooses op art, minimal art, and arte povera. In the large sculpture room, it is possible, as he says himself, and I quote, for the first time to exhibit several sculptures by English and American artists, some of which were acquired long ago in an ideal situation. The large rooms that Quist has added to the transitional museum of Van der Velde are therefore entirely suited to contemporary art. Installations come into their own. By now, these spaces have become almost classic, large, but human-sized, gray, but not colorless, made of hard materials, such as concrete, metal, and glass, but to make the soft transition between inside and outside, between nature and architecture, as smooth as possible. When Oxenar retires in 1990, he is offered the sculpture of 43 Roaring Forty by Carl André. This lies in the grass of the first outdoor gallery that you enter when walking into the sculpture garden. And it leads the visitor, as it were, to the park and forest where Oxenar placed the developments in sculptures of the 1960s and 70s. When Evert van Straten takes office in 1990, he observes that although a wealth of sculpture has been assembled in the sculpture garden, it is sometimes difficult for the visitors to find a way or to understand how the garden, park, and forest relate to each other. He seeks to a unifying concept for the site and a long-term vision for its maintenance. And to this end, to this end he invites Adrian Geuze of Landscape Architects West 8. One of the first things that Van Straten and Geuze change is that the garden will be open to the public all year round. Previously, the sculpture garden was only open during summer. But that had to change. Nature is not there merely to serve as a pretty background for the sculptures. It also is there to experience, to abandon yourself to. The result of which is, the result of which is that visitors can gain a much more diverse experience of the garden, precisely what Geuze has in mind when he presents his plan under the motto, how do we recalibrate the garden so that the public has a more general experience? He seeks to exploit the diversity of the landscape and improve it when necessary. 
and you can actually not read one word of it. Um, just for location, this is the building. It's called the park. Rhododendrons, small rooms, large grass, the Franse Berg, the forest, an event uh, terrain. So there are lots of different landscaping which he has brought into the garden and forest. So he seeks to exploit the diversity of the landscape and improve it where necessary by writing a specific management plan for the gardens, for the gardeners, sorry. Some patches of grass are maintained as lawns, while in other areas in the park we let it grow all season and become rather wild. And rhododendrons are pruned so that they form walls whereby space is created for a smaller sculpture in almost intimate rooms. And in 2005, Evert van Straten also built another pavilion in the park. This time, it is a pavilion that Aldo van Eyck designed for the Sonsbeek exhibition in 1966. It is almost the opposite of the Rietveld pavilion. While Rietveld, Rietveld's structure is open, space describing, van Eyck places the walls behind each other, almost like a scenery in a theater, and he lets the people wander through a labyrinthine structure past sculptures that are displayed in alcoves, on pedestals, and small squares in the middle of the building. It is a welcome addition to yet another type of space for the presentation of small sculptures in a setting that has a more human and domestic size. Now, at the start of the 20th century, 21st century, sorry, we observe that despite the fantastic extension of Quist, we are outgrowing our premises. Here you can see wonderfully how the building seems to merge with the surrounding nature. But the extended floor plan is no longer sufficient. We are certainly not the only ones. Here you see a nice progression in the use of space in the Krullen Muller Museum on the one hand and Museum Boymans van Beuning in Rotterdam on the other. And it shows very clearly that the use of space in the building has completely changed over the years and that the development is surprisingly similar in both museums. We have also had to contend with the boundaries of the building for years. It's nothing new. The numbers of visitors has increased enormously and the building from the 30s, 50s and 70s as a whole is actually no longer suited to the needs of a contemporary museum. And already under the direct directorship of Evert van Straten, Studies were carried out into the possibilities of expansion, but, and history seems to repeat itself here, the crisis at the beginning of the century, particularly the severe cutbacks of the Dutch government on art and culture, threw a spanner in the works. But in recent years, the plans have again been resurrected, and we've got around the table to think about that desire for expansion. Because the discovery of the fact that there is not enough space is not yet a solution. And we now have to answer the question of what we need, or better still, the question of what we think we need. Luckily, I don't have to think about spaces for stool glasses, for receptions of groups, and about how much surface area the shop and cafe require for optimal sales. But together with the current director, Lisette Pelsis, I get to concentrate on the space that we need for an optimal presentation of the collection and for making a good program. And what we really need is space for the presentation of post-war post art. Eventually, we want to be able to put a large number of our icons of the 20th century sculpture on permanent display. Like the paintings of Vincent van Gogh, the works of, just to name a few, Pistoletto or Jut, André and Dibitz also deserve a permanent place in the museum house on the Veluwe. What we want to work towards is a building and a garden, a museum and a park, as to quote Evert van Straten, as a paradise, a refuge, a temple, a retreat for reflection, a recreation center, an entertainment spot, a marketplace, a memorial, and a meditation center, unquote. We want to create a place to describe it with a contemporary term for a total experience, a place for an experience of beauty, for the encounter with challenging and proven art, to taste the me me melancholic 
the colony of a place to feel the sensation of curiosity and of mild irritation occasionally for consolation and healing and a smile. In short, a space for art founded and continued for the benefit and the pleasure of the community. Thank you very much. <laughs>